This conference will now be recorded. All right, everyone. Uh, we've got a crowded agenda today. Uh, so we've got, uh, for the first half hour, we're going to have Ilad do an update on behalf of the Bo Group. Um, and I think the, we're, we're the, the spec is almost ready. So we're, we're in the happy position of having two five specs ready to roll. And uh, I don't see David Rachkoff, but at 8.30, we'll have Tony Mastri Mastriani from Mentor, assuming he joins by then. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the call, so I'm here. Oh, that's you. That's you. Okay, I had a different Tony. All right. <laughs> yep. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right, let's roll. Okay, great. Uh, so as Bobby mentioned, I'm going to sort of give a quick overview and update on the uh, bunch of wires interface. Uh, my name is Alon. I'm uh, with Blue Cheetah Analog Design. Uh, I'll be presenting this, but uh, this is really representing the, the work of, of many, many people. Uh, more than I think I'll be able to mention, uh, but I just wanted to specifically mention, uh, you know, Bhatti obviously himself, uh, Satya Rao, who's on the call from Analog Port, uh, Shahab Arnalan from uh, from IR, and uh, Ken Bolton from Keysight uh, are all some of the uh, sort of key contributors. But again, there's many more, so I just you know I want to make sure the uh, credit is given where credit is due. So I figured I'd just start out with kind of, you know, at a very high level, what are some of the key features and goals of a bunch of wires? And I'll probably refer to it as Bo from here on out. Uh, so as hopefully everyone is sort of already uh, intimately aware of, uh, so Bo is a die to die parallel interface. Um, and I think, you know, sort of everything I'm about to say next is really where, where I think the differentiating factors are, where what really I think Bo was setting out to do was to be a flexible, scalable, scalable and low overhead solution for essentially as many data die parallel interfaces as as you know as one can potentially uh, sort of think as potentially being needed. So what are some of the sort of key features and specs that, that you know are, are sort of moving towards that? Um, the first, as I said, is that it really we really are pushing for as many usage scenarios uh, that people can think of to to try and sort of make both be applicable to them, as well as still supporting the ability for designers to optimize for their particular application scenario. So to achieve that, uh, Bo is compatible with a wide range of packages and, and process technologies. Uh, so both the organic laminates as well as advanced interposers. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about this later, but I think you know, uh, as of today, so to speak, you know, Bo is the only uh, sort of you know openly developed uh, uh, interface standard uh, that does actually support the organic laminates. Again, I'll say some more about that a little bit later. Uh, you know, Bo does actually have many different modes, and to zero order, you can think of this, you know, as of today, as being anywhere from about 2 to 16 gigabits per second per wire. Uh, these are single end interfaces. Again, I'll get some more into the detail in a moment. Uh, you know, Bo is, uh, appears to, you know, there's, there's nothing that we know of in the, in the standard, and as well as from implementations people are doing. Uh, you know, this appears to be very minimal to achieving very low power, uh, so less than about half a picojoule per bit. Uh, Latency-wise, uh, this is also going to be a very low latency and simple uh, sort of implementation of the PHY. So, you know, two to four nanoseconds is, is kind of the ballpark that, that one would expect. And I'll say some more detail about that again in a moment. Um, and then finally, I think another thing that sort of differentiates uh, versus some of the other things that are out there um, is that because we're trying to cover a reasonably wide range of usage scenarios, uh, you know, there is actually sort of reach out into the, nominally speaking, say about 25 millimeters or so, with either terminated or unterminated signaling, signaling um, is sort of explicitly part of, of what we're attempting to achieve here. Again, I saw a little bit more about that later, but as you can kind of see in sort of this picture here, uh, you can imagine that particularly in the sort of organic uh, packaging uh, types of things, where you may want to put together a, a broad variety of chiplets with you know all kinds of different dimensions associated with them, uh, you can pretty easily end up in scenarios where you have to sort of like dodge one chiplet along the way. Uh, and that's that's where you typically end up with needing uh, you know much longer reaches than you might at first uh, think about. I'll, I'll pause here. By the way, I guess I don't have a ton of time, but I do speak quickly. So if anyone has, has questions, you know, please, please feel free to just uh, pause me and ask at, at any point. Um, so so yeah, yeah, of course. On the um, the point five picojoule per bit is that with a twenty five millimeter reach uh, estimate? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so it, you know, this obviously there's a there's a set of assumptions that have to be made, and I'll, I'll clarify some more a couple of them later. But yes, I think even in a 20 to 25 millimeter reach, assuming a reasonable package design, uh, I, I do believe that number is actually achievable. Thank you. Yep. 
Okay, so inside of Bo, uh, I just figured I'd sort of talk a little bit about just how things are constructed and some of the features there. You know, the, the most basic element in Bo is what I call a slice. Uh, not, not I call what the standard defines as a slice. Um, slice slices consist of essentially 16 single-ended data bits, uh, a source synchronous differential half rate clock. Uh, you know, for those of you who are not familiar half rate, you know, you can, uh, you can equate that to DDR if you are familiar with that term. Um, and optionally, slices can include a forward error correction and an auxiliary bit. Um, you know, the FEC is, you know, not necessarily used by the PHI. In fact, not used by the PHI. It will be used by the link layer or above uh, to essentially perform, you know, sort of out of band uh, forward error correction. And the aux bit can be sort of used any which way, you know, one wants. There's nothing really in the PHI spec that says how to use it. Uh, but, you know, for example, if you're doing DBI, this is probably where you'd put that additional signal in. Um, there's nothing stopping one from implementing a, a sort of configurably bidirectional uh, slice, but typically speaking, and you know, sort of most of the standard is built around the uh, default assumption that the slices will be unidirectional. So I wanted to mention I'm sort of starting at this level because this is really the most basic unit of of Bo, um, and I think that is actually sort of a, an important factor uh, because what this implies is that. Uh, essentially, you know, you can kind of build up, you know, sort of almost anything that you want uh, by, you know, sort of taking various versions and configurations of slices and putting them together. So from a kind of granularity standpoint, you actually get very good uh, sort of ability to configure things simply by choosing the number of slices, uh, as opposed to, for example, you know, sort of taking an entire, I don't know, to make up an example, you know, five millimeter wide interface and only having, you know, maybe a factor of two variability in there. Here, you know, just however many slices you want, you're, you're absolutely allowed to, to put together and compose uh, following a set of rules that I'll describe in a moment. So another thing I wanted to highlight here, which was sort of an intentional design decision, is uh, essentially the slice to link layer interface is, is kind of as simple as one could think of making it. Um, and in particular, the five slices really include only the serialization to serialization function. There's no clock domain crossing or, or you know, sort of clock uncertainty uh, handling type of functionality included in the slice. Um, and again, I think this is a little bit different than design decisions made by, by several of the other uh, sort of interface standards that are out there. And the reason this particular decision is made is that uh, basically, you know, the, the need for existence of some sort of clock domain crossing and sort of how difficult that crossing is, is really very much usage dependent. Um, and so because of that, uh, you know, essentially in Bo, the decision was made that, okay, you know, if people need that or how they design it should really be done outside of the FI. And so if people, uh, you know, if there are scenarios where you really don't need that at all, or you can be much more aggressive, you know, that, that decision and that design option is now available to people uh, because the FI itself just really includes the bare minimum hardware that one would need. And so at the end of the day, this allows you to get to implementations that really would give you the lowest possible latency. So as I mentioned previously, you know, you can't actually compose uh, bow interfaces, uh, you know, sort of uh, to your heart's content, uh, to zero order. Uh, so this is sort of just how one might compose uh, various interfaces out of slices. Uh, you know, so an individual slice, you know, might look something like this in terms of its bump map. Uh, I'll say some more about that in a moment. Uh, just to sort of define a couple of terms here. Uh, stacking just implies that you're taking these slices and you're essentially lining them up. Uh, with each uh, slice moving closer in, you know, towards the inside side of the, the chiplet. Um, the idea here is that, you know, this is just showing an example stack up in an organic uh, sort of packaging technology, where typically speaking, uh, each slice would communicate to sort of, you know, slices uh, at a corresponding distance from the chip die edge uh, on essentially deeper and deeper layers within the package. Uh, again, there's nothing that forces you to do it this particular way, but representationally speaking, this is this is kind of a good way of thinking about things. Uh, just to find one more term, you know, sort of an entire link, uh, essentially is just saying, you know, logically, if I want to get, you know, sort of a, a particular sort of uh, group of slices to work together to communicate with another chiplet, where the group size could be as small as one, uh, that's what we're referring to as a link. Um, within a stack, by the way, you may or may not be within the same link, but typically speaking within a stack, you, you probably would be. And any link can be symmetric, asymmetric, unidirectional, meaning that you know, you can have all transmitters, all receivers, you know, 50-50 balance, you know, 80-20 balance, you know, not, nothing in the bow spec says, uh, you know, which way one needs to do that. That's entirely left up to the decision of the, uh, the users and designers. So one, the, one thing that is sort of important to mention here is that um, 
Bo sort of only requires one to follow a certain wire order on the package. Um, and it does not say anything about, you know, what the bump map needs to be or the bump composition or anything like this. It just says, you know, if you look at the wires on the package, the ordering should follow this specific uh, sort of, you know, set of requirements. And the reason for that is that, you know, this, this actually fosters quite a bit of flexibility. You know, if people want to have differing bump maps, differing, you know, sort of even package technologies and so on and so forth. You know, all of that is, is you know, very naturally encompassed by this. But it does retain a reasonable degree, you know, obviously within practical limits of interoperability, because, you know, if the wire orderings are, are defined, uh, you know, then it becomes much more straightforward to figure out how you can actually connect things together, uh, even with other uh, sort of design choices that may be made. Um, the particular ordering uh, basically was also chosen and the rules were chosen to make it so that essentially you can rotate chiplets um, and sort of make the connections happen uh, naturally and correctly without the need for additional multiplexers to kind of like swizzle buses around. Um, so in particular, transmit wires are numbered essentially clockwise around the chip perimeter uh, and receive slice wires are numbered counterclockwise. Um, and again, that's just really to support uh, rotational symmetry. So similarly, when you're putting together sort of slices uh, either into stacks or, or links, uh, the sort of the spec uh, basically says that we should number them following that same pattern. Uh, so transmitters essentially uh, are going clockwise around the perimeter of the of the die. Receivers going counterclockwise, and again, this is very much for, for the exact same motivation of just retaining that rotational symmetry. Um, there's no required arrangement of transmitters relative to receivers, or even you know within within a stack or within a link. Um, but the recommended arrangement is to essentially have alternating columns or columns you should sort of take uh, to mean, you know, it may be rows if you're an east-west, you know, here it's just drawn as north-south, so that's why we're referring to it as a column. Um, but it just basically means that, you know, uh, slices of sort of the same direction, you typically want to arrange them uh, kind of in the same dimension going into the die edge. Um, and the reason for this is that, you know, again, typically speaking, uh, things in the same direction within a stack tend to be within, you know, sort of the same logical link. Um, and so this type of arrangement just allows you to maintain physical proximity between the slices and their associated link layer while still retaining sort of all of the ability to support uh, rotational symmetry uh, that you could sort of imagine from other uh, types of arrangements. So the next thing I wanted to say a little bit about was just interoperability and flexibility. Um, and again, sort of the whole point here was that, you know, we really were trying to go after making something that, that can address a very wide range of applications. Um, so you can imagine that chiplets can interoperate here, uh, even over differences in bump pitch, um, probably up to about 20% 20, 20 or so. And this is really enabled by just, you know, specifying only the wire order. Um, that's not to say that one can't deal with uh, bump pitch differences larger than that, um, but obviously there are practical limitations on you know, either how much routing mismatch is tolerable or, you know, sort of how many layers you need to, to sort of, you know, rearrange things and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but similarly, you know, different stack depths and link compositions, uh, you know, as long as you sort of physically align things in a, in a way that, that's routable uh, is definitely supported. Uh, as we've talked about a lot already, rotation is supported. Um, and, and maybe another sort of very important point is that, you know, the, you know, the, there's no particular sort of decisions here that were made um, and, and in fact, intentionally, there's many cases where we try to make the sort of specification decisions in a way that it would really allow flexibility in the both process technology that you want to use and the implementation, both from a packaging and, you know, sort of process or, you know, sort of our circuit design standpoint. Um, and one sort of important point here is that DOW does require that any sort of fine implementation would support uh, signaling based on a 0 0.75 volt uh, IO supply. Um, there's nothing stopping one from using other choices of supply voltage, uh, but 0 0.75 volts was sort of chosen as, as a voltage that, you know, relatively universally should be supportable across a very broad range of process technologies. So similarly, in terms of, you know, besides interoperability, you know, things that, that you know, implementers and, and chiplet uh, sort of users can, can choose, you know, as we said, there's a wide variety of data rates that one can use, anywhere from 2 to 16 gigabits per second per wire. Uh, the IO voltage itself is actually uh, something that one can select. Uh, similarly, you know, whether or not you use terminated signaling, uh, so unterminated or source terminated only or doubly terminated, uh, as well as in fact, even, you know, sort of which scheme you use for termination on the receiver should you choose to do so, meaning, you know, do you terminate to ground, do you terminate to the supplier, to mid rail, all of these are essentially options that the uh, chiplet and VI implementers can, uh, can choose and, and you know, turn the knobs as they please. You can imagine that for some of these longer reaches is where termination becomes the most relevant. 
Uh, but again, you know, essentially people have the flexibility to choose where in that regime they operate depending upon their own application scenario. Similarly, as we've talked a lot about already, you know, bump pitch, stack depth, the composition of the links, uh, you know, the packaging technology, these are all things that, you know, are very much intentionally left as options open to people to make the appropriate selection on, uh, but still fit within the overall bow umbrella. So one of the things that you know I myself have been involved a lot in, and and you know sort of went through a lot of evolution uh, over the last uh, probably six months or so, um, is that we we sort of went through and have developed a fairly detailed um, and you know fairly complete set of electrical and timing specifications. Um, and essentially the intention here is that you know if you go look in the spec, which I'll say more about in a moment. You know, there's a pretty detailed set of these that, that you know you can kind of read through and, and see what they're saying. You know, there's just some examples in the pictures off there on the right. But really, the intention here is that these specifications are, are detailed enough to provide clear dot, uh, guidance. To people who are going to go and design these files, uh, but they're also defined in a way that allow the flexibility to, to sort of trade between things that that make sense. And at the end of the day, obviously, you know, sort of defining the set of specifications would also sort of help to ensure and make it much easier for designers to actually build things that will interoperate with each other. Another important point that I did want to make is that uh, essentially it was a conscious design decision made to set the bit error rate requirement um, at a relatively relaxed level of 1E minus 15. Um, I'll explain why I mean that's re relatively relaxed or why I say that in a moment. Um, but basically what, you know, this choice was made so that uh, people who are doing chip implementations with relatively low aggregate bandwidth, um, but that may be very heavily power constrained, uh, you know, 1 minus 15 for, for this type of link and the type of, you know, reaches and everything that we're thinking of is something that should be pretty easily achievable without really having a, a noticeable impact on the power efficiency of these kinds of designs. Having said that, you know, this is still a, a sort of good enough uh, error rate that fine implementers could feasibly choose to exceed that spec, you know, perhaps even fairly significantly and completely avoid the need for, need for error correction, which you can imagine if you're doing something with, you know, a lot of aggregate bandwidth, which, you know, many of the high performance applications are, are going to be doing, you know, in those cases, especially if you want low latency, you know, you really have to push the error rates substantially down below this. And, and essentially, you know, 1E minus 15 was sort of chosen as, okay, something that people should be able to realize, even if they're very, very power constrained and don't have a lot of bandwidth, uh, but, you know, but it would still allow people to sort of optimize further beyond that point to meet the requirements of these much you know, sort of higher throughput uh, applications. So in terms of you know the the types of channels that, that you know one can support, um, you know as you can imagine, because of the flexibility that we intrinsically are trying to to sort of uh, encompass here, uh, that means that you know we sort of have to do things in a way that you know many different types of channels, you know. Uh, if we're overly sort of specific, you know, it, it may become problematic to actually support the types of flexibility that we're interested in. And so the decision here that, that again was sort of consciously made is to eventually it, to basically say that you know we won't put you know very specific and let's say detailed requirements on the channel itself, other than to say that as long as a channel achieves essentially a certain amount of eye height and, and eye width uh, as seen by the receiver. Uh, using reference parameters of, of essentially, you know, transmitting receivers as defined by the electrical specs. You know, as long as the channel does that, it's deemed compliant. Um, you know, so if somebody builds a, let's say, 50 millimeter long channel that happens to meet all the specifications, great, it's compliant. Um, you know, if somebody builds something that, you know, is, is, you know, completely different packaging technology and you know, completely different reach and so on and so forth, you know, again, as long as you meet those requirements, then it's deemed to be a compliant channel. The next natural question you may ask is, well, okay, so how do I know if I'm actually compliant or not? Uh, there, the, there is under development, uh, basically right now as we speak, uh, a set of open source software uh, that will essentially enable system and package designers to actually check compliance on their uh, individual channels. Uh, this is not available just yet, uh, but as I said, it's, it's under development uh, as we speak, uh, and that is something that you know, will be released uh, you know, as, soon as, uh, as soon as it's ready. Uh, I suspect in the next few months or so. So one maybe sort of uh, small but but important point: the only sort of hard channel specification is that the within slice skew uh, should be less than you know 6.67 picoseconds between the clock and the data lines. Uh, this is mostly just so that implementers know kind of like what's the worst skew they should expect to see and potentially need to be able to correct due to the channel itself. Um, and this you know corresponds to about a one millimeter uh, length mismatch on typical substrates. Uh, so that was sort of selected to be 
you know, what we believe to be something that's fairly reasonable given the overall reaches that, that we're trying to achieve uh, in the first place. Okay, so I just wanted to give sort of a, a, a rough feeling for, for sort of what some of this might translate into uh, in terms of just some of the kind of like, let's say, physical specifications of things uh, in terms of, you know, sort of how you put these together. Uh, so I don't necessarily walk through kind of every entry point in, in this sort of pair of tables, uh, but I'll maybe just sort of highlight a few of them just to, again, sort of show that, you know, even though we've sort of tried to retain a lot of flexibility, there's really nothing stopping you from sort of uh, pushing towards either end of the sort of performance curve. Uh, so as an example, uh, you know, let's say that you're in the sort of very low cost uh, regime um, and you're using an organic package where essentially you're getting away with, you know, sort of only one or two sort of surface buildup layers in the package. Um, you're not shooting for sort of anything particularly aggressive from a bunch of bump pitch standpoint. And maybe, you know, again, your net data throughput requirement is not very high. So you're operating at one of the lower data rate modes. You know, this is going to put you roughly in the 55-ish gigabits per second per millimeter from a simple, from a shoreline bandwidth density uh, sort of standpoint. Um, and again, these numbers are just coming from essentially computing what would be the pitch of one of these uh, BOW phi slices. Um, and as you sort of put enough of these phi slices down, the, the pitch is sort of what would end up setting the, the overall bandwidth density. So that's why things are computed uh, this particular way. But you can see, you know, again, this is, oh yeah, question? But, but how does the bit error rate change with with each of these, or is it not? It's a good question. So, you know, th that's really implementation dependent uh, in the sense of the BOW spec only says that one must do better than one E minus 15, right? That, mm -hmm. That's what the BOW spec uh, sort of requires. But there's nothing stopping people from, you know, going and implementing things that, that you know, would do better than that should they choose to. Uh, so, it's just so that would be like adding FEC or something like that. Well, yeah, so either by adding FEC or sort of, you know, achieving performance specifications better right. than what the standard requires and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, so speaking, for example, narrowly for, for Blue Cheetah, uh, you know, we, we expect to implement, you know, 1E minus 20 bit error rates uh, kind of across this entire sort of set of tables that or scenarios that you see here uh -huh. um, without even FEC, but just simply by, you know, sort of uh, overperforming on some of the particular performance uh, specifications in the electrical standard. Um, sure, but how does that affect your uh, picojoule per bit then? Yeah, I mean, it depends on obviously, again, the, the sort of the details of the implementation and the reach and so okay. on and so forth. Um, sure. Just, you know, again, speaking narrowly, kind of, you know, for Blue since that's data that I have, and since right. Sachin's here, he, he can comment. Um, you know, we expect to be able to hit uh, basically 300 femtojoules per bit or less um, mm -hmm. over about 10 millimeter reach uh, or less, uh, you know, approximately speaking. Uh, there are some longer channels where you could still hit that. You know, there's uh, certainly shorter channels where you can hit that. But ballpark, that's uh, that's where we're seeing things uh, sort of landing at. Okay. Now, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the ballpark estimates. Yeah, of course. Of course. Any other questions, by the way? Yeah, I love the, for the interposer at stack depth, uh, stack depth of eight, uh, how deep is that in terms of millimeters? Ah, yeah, so that, that depends on, um, th there's a bunch of design decisions that one can sort of tweak, uh, but that's probably about a millimeter or so, you know, a millimeter and a half into the die. And again, depends on exactly, you know, which interposer, how you built it and so on and so forth, but it's approximately that, that, that deep. You, you said so, millimeter for eight stack depth. Uh, one, one to 1 1.5 millimeter approximately. Okay, thank you. Yep. And again, you know, don't uh, don't take that as set in stone. That's just a you know rough ballpark. Yeah. So as I said, the the sort of the real point here was just that you know that there's a pretty broad range of scenarios that one can imagine. Uh, that that you know that you know at least I've actually run into people that seem to be interested in in kind of all of these types of scenarios. Um, and really, the point here was that you know this this is a fairly flexible uh, sort of definition of things. And and you know all of these could be done actually with with bow. Uh, obviously, the designs themselves are fairly different, and you know, most likely you're not going to be able to interoperate over anything more than like a slice between a 40 micron thing and a 130 micron thing. But those are very likely in very different packages, anyways, and so that's you know probably not the uh, the, the most critical uh, sort of uh, thing that people will care about. 
So just to quickly kind of you know say a little bit about the status and then leave you know just a couple of minutes at least for further questions. Um, you know the the version quote unquote 1.0 of the spec and what we mean by 1.0 here is you know this is the thing that we're sort of saying yeah you know this is the stuff people should go out and, and really be comfortable uh, in in starting to build things around um, is very nearly complete. Um, and you know one thing that I think is you know I don't know if differentiating per se but but is somewhat unique. You know this is already publicly available to to the world. Um, so the link is included here. If you just you know go to Google and search for you know ODSA BOW spec, you'll you'll probably find it quite quickly. Um, so I'd encourage everybody to go you know sort of take a look and, and browse through. Uh, you know still is a small opportunity now for for sort of further feedback and you know edits and corrections. Uh, but you know even if not, just you know sort of taking a look and seeing you know what's in there uh, is you know everyone's more than welcome. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to really quickly mention is that there are multiple bunch of wireflies and test chips uh, being designed by by several companies. Uh, in particular, Blue Cheetah and D-Matrix, I believe along with uh, Analog Port, uh, are developing uh, some community-funded BOW test chips, uh, specifically in some advanced FinFET processes. Uh, so things like uh, you know, getting some PCBs with you know, these test chips and embedded inside of them to be able to play with, uh, participating in design reviews and, and various other forms of enticements uh, are being offered to you know, sort of companies and uh, people that are contributing either through cash or in-kind. Uh, you know, that was like the super minor sales pitch. Uh, you know, if you're interested in more on that, uh, probably Boppy or DJ, if he's on, are, are the right folks to, to talk to that uh, a little bit more. So, yeah, just to, to really quickly summarize, um, hopefully, you know, sort of the message that, you know, what we're really trying to do here is, is kind of come up with an interface that can be fairly universal in terms of package, process, performance, and complexity. Um, and sort of, you know, just let you sort of operate in all those different spaces, but without needing to actually switch standards to do so. Uh, I think that's really kind of where where Bo is is fairly unique. Um, having said that, you know one thing that, that is also certainly true, uh, Bo is currently really the only openly developed die to die interface, uh, at least proposal that supports actually the organic laminate packages. Uh, it also happens to be the only openly developed uh, sort of interface proposal uh, that doesn't require or imply a specific technology from a packaging uh, standpoint. Uh, but you know those two in, in this particular case uh, sort of happen to be equivalent. So as I mentioned a moment ago, the spec, you know, 1.0 version is, is very nearly complete and, and everyone is, is you know, sort of perfectly, uh, uh, you know, available to, to go and take a look uh, anytime you'd like to. So I think that's what I've got. Uh, you know, I think I maybe have like a minute, so I'm happy to, to answer any last uh, questions. On the money. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> I, I just I, I do want to say it's a draft version 1.0. Sorry about that, but yeah. The, no, fair enough. Yes. <laughs> uh, Ella, this is JP. A uh, question. Thank you for the very nice presentation. Sure and thing. you had one slide. You showed that different uh, fine pitch uh, substrates, right? Where you have bow. Yeah, this particular uh, slide. And if you, I'm wondering if you're using 40 micron pitch, is there any penalty in power because the distance will be shorter, but bow originally was designed for long reach, right? Uh, yeah, it's it's a great question. Um, so for the shorter reach, and you might notice, you know, there's a couple of different data rate options here. Uh, the bow 128 was the, you know, that 40 micron one, I happened to put bow 128 there. Uh, that's the eight gig per line. Um, you know, for, for sort of sub four millimeters or three, which is probably where you're at with something like this, uh, you, you, you probably just would run it unterminated. Mm -hmm. So the same, I, I was imagining that you have for organic substrates, you have some equalizer or something like this, and you will have ability to turn off in this case, is it for short reach? Uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a good question. Um, you know, I, 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 I um, I would not want to comment for for others, so I'll comment specifically for Blue Cheetah. Um, you know, in, in our case, there's actually no equalization. Um, the the channel itself, the sort of majority of degradation from the channel is actually crosstalk. Um, okay. So unless you're going to do sort of a crosstalk canceller kind of thing, you know, the, the equalization itself probably isn't going to help you very much. Um, may, it might even actually hurt you. Um, so in our case, it's really just selectable termination, and and that you know from that standpoint, that's a that's pretty easy to, to you know flip the CSR bit to to control. Okay, thank you. Yep, of course. All right, thank you. Um, any other questions? Uh, we will uh, we can even do a follow up next week. But we have a Ila, thank you. I want to hand it sure over thing. to our next guest, Tony. Let me see if I made you a presenter. Yep. 
Sorry about no. the heart uh, cut off, Elad, so much. No, no, no problem. No problem. Um, I hit share. Are you guys seeing my slides? We can see your, yeah, now we can. Okay. Let me go into present mode here. Okay. Are you seeing the slides or the notes? Uh, we're actually seeing the notes now. We're seeing the. All right. So let me swap screens. Okay. Uh, how do we do that? Oh, you can do, yeah, that one display settings. Display settings, okay. How's that? Looks good. Okay, great. All right, quick intro. My name is Tony Mastriani. I work for Siemens EDA, and I've been working with David and Jawad and the rest of the CDX group uh, close to a year. And um, I fairly recently kind of took uh, responsibility for writing the modeling chapter of, of our white paper, the CDX white paper. So what we did is, uh, uh, we we uh, we thought the modeling section was for, far enough along where we would go off and uh, we submitted that for a, a white paper to the IEEE 3DIC conference coming up uh, next month. Uh, that paper was accepted. So we kind of carved out uh, the chapter three of our CDX white paper and uh, put that into the IEEE uh, IEEE um, template and uh, that's been accepted. So I'll be presenting that uh, next month at the conference. Uh, David asked if I could uh, uh, share that with the group. So I kind of whipped together a very rough draft just for this purposes. So the templates I have may need to be modified. So, um, uh, so, so this is kind of the first trial run. It's a little bit rough, but uh, what I'd like to do is kind of walk through the slides and uh, I would like feedback from anybody. Um, you know, I'll probably be uh, tweaking this a little bit, cleaning it up, maybe adding some diagrams. Um, but here we go. So uh, uh, the, the conference is going to be NC State. And um, we'll start with uh, a chiplet uh, definition, uh, just so we level set. So. Um, a chiplet differs from a conventional die in that a chiplet cannot typically be packaged separately and still operate uh, effectively as a device. So the um, you know the, the the advantages of system and package and heterogeneous integration offer considerable benefits uh, in terms of performance, cost, yield, and low power. Um, for the purposes of this paper, I'm going to define a chiplet. Uh, we're, we're really focus, focusing on 2.5D interposer-based designs. Uh, we will look at 3D later and, and other approaches, but we wanted to keep focus, uh, so we decided we would focus on 2.5D type applications. So uh, just a quick uh, intro about CDX. Uh, so CDX, and I, I know you guys know what CDX is, but for the audience, uh, CDX is a working group within the OCP subproject under ODSA, and we are chartered to recommend standardized chiplet models and workflows to uh, facilitate a chiplet ecosystem. So the group is comprised of uh, VDA vendors, actual chiplet providers, as well as uh, system and package uh, integrators and users. So there are several other groups in ODSA that are looking at other areas, such as die-to-die -die interfaces, uh, the, the Bo uh, example we just saw, um, security agents, and business models, as well as other related chiplet topics. So uh, the CDX group is actively working on a white paper, and this presentation uh, is uh, uh, representative of the chiplet modeling chapter of, of the CDX white paper. So a common set of chiplet models or deliverables from uh, chiplet providers uh, is required to ensure operability in um, system and package workflows. 
So some of the key tenants uh, we use to comprise the model list are, uh, we would like those to be mach uh, machine readable models. So we strongly encourage uh, to have, have them machine readable. Uh, XML is a good format and uh, you know other standards. Uh, we do want to leverage existing standards as much as possible. Uh, in some cases, we may have to modify or extend some of those standards. And if there's no standards out there, we'll drive some of the requirements. So we have a few cases where we are driving some, some new uh, proposals for, for standards. Um, although we'd like everything to be readable, uh, machine readable, uh, there still will be a need for some documentation, integration guidelines. So that is an expectation. Um, additionally, secure, security and traceability assurance is going to be an important requirement. So we recently added that um, to the, uh, to, to the uh, uh, list of models. So uh, enabling a chiplet ecosystem is, is similar to, to that of uh, um, a, a silicon on chip type of process. So you need the technology. So, you know, for an SOC, this would be the, the process, the design rules and all that such. You need the IP. So IP developers will develop the IP for integration in the chip. Uh, you need the tools and the workflows and the design kits as well as the business model. So analogous to that, um, for the chiplet ecosystem, the technologies we're talking about here are your silicon and organic interposers. And when I say organic, I'm referring to RDL fan out type technologies, as well as 3D stack die. Um, for IP, we're really viewing the chiplets or, or known good die as really kind of IP. And um, we will require some standardization of, of those models or deliverables uh, with, for, for that IP, right? So if you're acquiring uh, some IP to, for a chip, you're going to get your, your, uh, your left views and dot libs and GDS and all that good stuff. So um, there is a different set of deliverables for chiplets. And uh, what we really focused on is trying to take a first cut at proposing what those models are. Uh, of course, the other things we have to worry about, the die-to-die -die interfaces and the assembly rules. And, um, uh, you know, once, once you have the IP and the technology, then you need the tools and the design flows and the design kits to, to be able to do those designs. And that's where the EDA vendors come in um, to, to support that. And then the business models, um, you know, this is the distribution, you know, how, how they sell these chiplets, the, the contracts. And uh, so it's a little bit different. Uh, these chiplet uh, will, will come from, you know, fabulous semi type companies, uh, but they're, it's, it's very different than selling a standard part, right? So you're selling a known good die, um, and, uh, you know, they're, you're, you're going to have to kind of treat it more like IP as opposed to just selling a part. So there's different models and different business models. So there is an ODS group that's looking into some, some of those kind of issues. Okay, so the deployment of uh, chiplet-based ecosystems uh, does require uh, the standardization of these models, and that's what we're trying to define. Uh, it would also require the adoption of, of these models by chiplet providers. So what we're trying to do is propose, um, you know, what these chiplet models are, and then, um, you know, eventually, we'll, hopefully, we'll get the chiplet providers to, to go ahead and adopt that. So it is going to take some time for that to happen, uh, but the sooner we get started, the better. Uh, standardization of the die-to-die -die interfaces, I think that's... Um, progressing well. I think BOW is a good example, and there's others out there. Uh, HBM certainly has been around for some time, uh, but that, that really is uh, um, d d different types of die-to-die -die general purpose interfaces are going to be required uh, for, for the, uh, you know, the broad-based chiplet ecosystem. Um, the other thing we need to look into is, is uh, coming up with the standard set of uh, package assembly rules. So there are some efforts going on to try to have some common uh, rules uh, that uh, would then be adopted by the package assemblers and vendors. So that it is an area that we're going to be looking into shortly. And then again, last but not least, the EDA support for these chiplet models, assembly rules, and workflows. 
Okay, so here's the proposed set of models. So the models include um, thermal, physical, mechanical, IO, behavioral, power, signal integrity, power integrity, electrical rules, test security, and documentation. So I'll, I'll go through these uh, in a little bit of detail, but um, really the, the, the white paper gets into a lot more detail. And by the way, the, the white paper that we have, uh, um, you know, David can post that if anybody wants to, uh, to, to, to take a look at that white paper. So we'll start with the thermal. Again, this is an existing standard, uh, ECMXL, which is a JETAC, JEP 181. So we've adopted that for thermal models. Uh, we are making some recommendations to do some minor enhancements to, to that uh, standard to, to, to support chips, but uh, we're gonna leverage that uh, standard as much as possible. So for physical, mechanical, and I.O., I think some of the standard type, um, uh, ASIC type uh, views, uh, LEF, uh, GDS, or OASIS, and SPICE to support LDS kind of things are, are appropriate. Um, so we've included that in the list. Um, for the more package-centric type information, um, there really was nothing out there. Uh, so we, we looked around and um, uh, we, we, we came, came up with uh, ZEF as uh, there was a lot of work put into that by Zglu. And uh, uh, so what we're, we're doing is, is modifying the uh, ZEF to put it into an XML format. And uh, we do have a sponsor where we'll try to get that uh, into a JEP standard. So extending the JEP 30 uh, P101 standard. Uh, so uh, we do have a couple of, couple of folks in the group that are actively um, supporting and upgrade, upgrading this uh, ZEF XML format. Um, <clears throat> behavioral models, I think that's fairly straightforward. Uh, we want system Verilog, but, and then there's other optional models for you know, Verilog or system C. So, so those would be delivered uh, with each again. And again, the, these models, uh, this proposal here, this list of models is, is our expectation of what chiplet providers would be uh, distributing when they, when they sell their, their chiplets. So power, uh, Liberty models, and IEEE 2416. Uh, we did include UPF and CPF uh, as options, so that may be helpful to have a little bit of uh, uh, understanding on how the power domains are set up, but those, those are kind of optional. Uh, for signal integrity, really IBIS and IBIS AMI for high-speed type of interfaces. Uh, or, or SPICE uh, uh, netless for the uh, IO drivers would be sufficient. Uh, for power integrity anal analysis, it's uh, really uh, CPM models uh, is all that's required. Now, again, to do the analysis, you're gonna need uh, other deliverables, but uh, this list is, is the expectation of what uh, we expect chiplet providers to provide uh, to the SIP integrators. Uh, for electrical rules, this is another area that's kind of new, um, uh, defining, um, you know, uh, electrical type things, ESD, uh, pin mapping. There's a, a whole slew of the, the stuff that, that would be included in this list. Uh, a lot of that was already included in ZEF, so uh, we're going to leverage that. And again, uh, that, that uh, we'll also try to get that into, uh, it's actually another, um, uh, the E101 uh, version of the JEP standard uh, will do that. Uh, I'd say test is probably one of the biggest challenges in SIP design. Um, although the chiplets are being uh, uh, provided, it is known good die. Uh, so in theory, they've been tested and they should work. Um, but you know, once you assemble it into a package, um, there may have been some damage or something may have happened. And you know, there may be some different test conditions that may be required for the particular SIP application. So we are asking uh, for all the test deliverables for each of those chiplets. So we have the ability to, to test each of those chiplets in the context of the SIP. <clears throat> so the, the challenge with uh, a chiplet integrated into a package, you don't have access to all the pins. So we need to make sure that you know we're using the uh, 
you know, the uh, standard uh, IEEE standard interfaces, JTAG, and uh, um, and 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 get the patterns and the d deliverables uh, for those chiplets, so that the 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 SIP integrator has the ability to run those tests. You know, this the scan test, the BIS test uh, for high speed uh, loopback. Um, in addition to testing each of the chiplets, we also need to check the die to die interfaces. So so that would be you could use boundary scan for simple um, functionality type checks. And then, where possible, uh, try to do some high-speed loopback integrations to do some at-speed testing. And there may be also a need to do some more kind of system-level functional type tests to check the operation of the uh, the overall device, um, you know, that, that you're developing in, in the SIP. So um, security, uh, this is, is definitely going to become, um, a, I'd say, probably a requirement for, for Melero type uh, recommendations. So we recently did add this to the, uh, to the proposed list of models. Um, you know, we're not, we're not doing a deep dive in this in the CDX group. There's other groups looking into this. Um, but you know, for some customers, this this may be mandatory. It, it, commercial is, is as well as um, you know government type and uh, requirements. And you know, as I mentioned, uh, the documentation and guidelines really is something that uh, you know should be provided in in addition to these uh, machine readable models. So this would include just general documentation, kind of a data sheet, paper data sheet. Uh, but also integration guidelines. So often IP vendors for silicon IP will provide uh, silicon integration guidelines. You know, how do you, how do you integrate this into a chip? We'll need something similar in terms of how you integrate this into a system and package uh, as well as tests. Um, you know, how, you know, the, the, these deliverables that are provided in the test section above, uh, we'll need some documentation to, to assist the, the DFT and test engineers uh, how, how, to, how to test their parts in the context within a SIP. Uh, if there's firmware on the chiplet, we'll need the firmware and any documentation associated with that. And, and again, uh, if there's security agent, uh, there, there would most likely be some, some uh, you know, documentation required for that. So in um, some, you yes. Um, you know, in the previous slide, would this slide be more appropriately labeled chiplet models? Because we are referring to chiplets that go into a system, right? Yes. Okay. So just um, when you say chip models, I guess it's just a generalization, but this. Oh, that's a typo. Okay. That's a typo. Thank you. Oh, okay. You're absolutely Sorry. right. Thank you. Yep. Just, I just wanted to make sure good, I got it. Thank you. Good, good catch. And again, we can send this off. I'd, I'd like feedback from anybody else if we want to tweak this, but uh, good point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So in, in summary, I, I think the benefits of heterogeneous, heterogeneous integration really are driving uh, the, the demand uh, for, for new markets and applications. So we do see the uh, really uh, an explosion in, in uh, you know, this, these chiplet type devices. So um, two and a half D HBM packaging technologies and the associated you know workflows with those are relatively mature. So I'd say for the technology is in pretty good shape as well as the workflows. Uh, the die to die interfaces, uh, I think there's good progress. There's a lot of good standards out there, and there's there's IP available. Um, so so th those I think are in reasonable shape. Uh, so the initial focus here for the model deliverables uh, for the CDX group is, as, as, as I mentioned, the 2.5D inter, interposer-based type chiplet models. And then we, we, we did agree we would focus initially on 2.5D, but 3D, you know, we'll have to look into that. I think we have a little bit more time. And it, it's uh, most likely uh, 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 maybe a, a minor addition of a few model, and there may be some models that are not required for 3D. But we decided up front uh, we would, you know, just simplify the problem and focus on two and a half D. Uh, the next area of focus that we'll be looking at are um, looking into these common uh, two and a half and three D assembly rules, uh, as well as some of the uh, uh, system and package uh, EDA workflows. 
So I would like to acknowledge all the CDX authors. Uh, so these are the authors that participated uh, for the um, modeling section of, of the white paper. And we had a lot of other contributors as, as well. So we'd like to acknowledge them as well. And um, you know, CDX is an open and active work group. And we are looking for additional volunteers to work with us to further develop our chip models and workflows. So. Um, uh, I just wanted to make sure that you know the ODS folks were were okay with this, but I thought this would be a, a good opportunity to invite more participants and a broader audience. Okay, thank you for your time and your interest. Uh, and uh, again, looking forward to any feedback uh, as to how we can do this. And um, uh, um, you know, I, any, are there any, probably, um, I probably do need a template. So if somebody could take an action to get me the latest template, I just grabbed something from David here, but this was a, um, but go ahead, I'm sorry, question. No, two, two questions, I guess. One is, um, what are the specific areas in which you're looking for feedback? Or is there any, or is there any specific area? Just, any just general feedbacks, you know. So we've got one from Anu with the, the typo, but if there's anything else, you know, you'd like to see edit. Um, you know, the, the presentation time is 20 minutes. Um, so, uh, you know, I was actually, uh, you know, 20 minutes is, is a little tight, but um, in the white paper, we get into a lot more detail um, uh, in, in, into, you know, talking a little bit more background about some of these different models. In 20 minutes, I'm not gonna be able to get, get into that, so. Uh, Would you like to come back? Uh, we're happy to, you know, sometime in the end of November or? Well, no, what I'm saying in, in the 20 minute presentation that I'm doing at the conference, I'm not going to be able to get oh. into the little detail. So, so really what I would encourage, you know, is just read the white paper. So there's, you know, there's a lot more detail and information in there that'll kind of put these models in, in the context. Uh, so if I can add a few more slides, you know, in the general presentation, I, I may, may do those, but, uh, uh, again, 20 minutes is, is not a lot of time. And when you're looking for a template, is it for the slide deck or for the... Uh... Yeah, for the slide deck. So, so I am presenting this on behalf of CDX. So, um, you know, I, I, I felt that, you know, for proposing a standard, I, I, I want to present this on behalf of uh, CDX. Okay. So I want to make sure I use your official template. Okay. If this is okay, that's fine. But. This should be okay, but I'll, I'll check it out and get back to you. But I, I think it should be okay. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I like the one that, um, uh, you know, a lot just had it. it you know, this, this really had some, it was a little bit cumbersome to work with this. But if this is okay, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> okay. okay. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Tony? Uh, Sorry, yep. go ahead. I can I can take it. Go next. Uh, on your list of models, uh, is there a plan to say here of all these, every chiplet vendor must provide a minimum set out of these, or some might well, be on the market and so on? So it's kind of implied if it doesn't say recommended or optional. It's required now. We're we're not a governing body, so I don't think we're empowered to say it's required. But this is what we're proposing. Um, you know, I I I think you know we'll we'll hopefully we'll get some feedback and you know we'll get general adoption. But I suspect you know particularly in the area of test, um, you know we'll we'll see. Uh, we we try to 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 be bold and and uh, ask. Uh, for as much as we can get, hopefully we'll get it. If not, you know, we, we may get some, but in general, you know, it's really up to the chiplet providers. You know, in some cases, these models may not be applicable, right? If you have a VRM, you know, do you really need right. a functional model? So, so I think, you know, we have to take a little bit of poetic license. So it depends on the type of IP. Um, you know, if if it's you don't need a, a you you won't need a Verilog AMS model if it's a simple digital chip, right? Is another example. So, thank you.
Okay. Any more questions for Tony? I, I think uh, very quickly, the in one of the last slides, I think, Tony, you mentioned that there's a little more work needed for 3D chiplet uh, chiplets. Yes. So the HPM itself is like a 3D chiplet, and that's pretty well established. So I'm, I'm trying to understand, for example, what additional... Well, yeah, I mean, HBMs, they exist, but, but as we start doing general purpose stack die, right? So if you're stacking one die on top of another, you could view those are two chiplets that are being integrated vertically rather than horizontally, right? So there may be some additional models required to support stack die. Okay. We just yeah, I think the haven't HBM... put a lot of time and energy into that today, but you know, we yeah, we just said we let's focus on two and a half D. That's mainstream today, or will be, but three D. We have a little time, but you know, go ahead, Anna. I'm sorry. Um, no, no, I just want to say I think um, H HBM is sort of a very specific subset of three D, because now you're stacking identical die. Um, in the you know every interface between the the vertical die is identical, but as we stretch this to different die memory on logic, logic on logic, goodness knows what on what, I think yep. it gets a little wider. Uh, HBM is very narrow and and beautifully focused with the JDEX standard, so it's a, it's a little bit um, a very uh, clean uh, subset. Uh, agreed, okay. and and it is yeah. HBM is it's kind of mature, but it's very specific. It's got very specialized models. They're standards, so people know how to test it. When you go to general purpose IP, it's it's a different ball game. So so it it really is a a, a very focused subset. Uh, HBM. So yeah, absolutely. I think uh, you you hit the with the answer. I think you hit the nail on the head. I was worried. I mean, there's a. Uh, uh, questions coming up about uh, using these similar kind of chiplets to do I/O with uh, optical engines, and so uh, I, I think you, your answer explained that. Yes, I think there's some consideration that that uh -huh. may happen there. Yep, thank you. Sure. Okay, thank you. All right. Hey, also. Um... No meeting, probably the next two weeks, I'll confirm. We don't have an uh, agenda topic in the week after as the, uh, as the summit. So uh, please watch your email. Other than that, thank you to Elad and uh, Tony. Everybody have a good weekend. Okay. Thanks, Take everyone. This conference will now be recorded. Ah, sorry about that.